It is a joy to be with you once again, and this time preaching to more than just a handful of musicians over here and tech people in the back to have a few more people in the pews is helpful for both your hearing and also for my preaching. It's hard to preach when there's just a camera and a couple people here and there, so it is a joy to be back with you once again. As uh, John just mentioned, uh, we did change our name back in the summer, July, and uh, it was after about a year's worth of discussion, and we are very thankful to the Lord for His guiding us through that process, as it's not easy to change a church's name, as I'm sure you guys remember, those of you who are here, about, what, six, seven years ago when you changed it, and so um, we're thankful to the Lord for that. Turn with me in in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 9, Mark 9. I've been working verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark at our church. I actually haven't preached this sermon yet. Normally when preachers switch like this, we preach a sermon that we've already preached. However, I had been working on this one a week ago, but then my family got sick and I wasn't able to preach it. And so this passage has been on my heart since a week ago, so I am really excited to preach it for you this morning. And I promise that my congregation will eventually hear this passage for themselves. Mark chapter 9, verse 1, I'll be reading out of the New International Version. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There, he, Jesus, was transformed, transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a voice appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, they looked around. When they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Have you ever had an epiphany? I don't mean a divine visitation from God, but I mean like a a moment of sudden revelation or insight. Something dawns on you, like a light bulb moment. Maybe in the old cartoons, like you have that literal light bulb that goes boing right behind their head. Do you remember those cartoons? You're trying to think of of a solution for something, and then boom, all of a sudden it pops into your head and like, yes, I figured it out. Or you can, you can imagine a situation where someone, the solution is right in front of a person, but they just can't get it. And all of a sudden, they have an epiphany. And you see that moment in their eyes when they realize the answer to the solution, you know, the problem that they're trying to find. Well, in our passage for this morning, we have something similar to that. Peter, in our previous section, which we didn't read this morning, you can glance back to chapter 8 if you like, verses uh, 29 and 30. Peter finally announces that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus asks him, who do people say that I am? And he says, well, they they say this, they say that. But then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? 
And then Peter says, you are the Messiah. But then the right after that, Peter rebukes Jesus for saying that Jesus will suffer, die, and rise again. So you'd think by the time we get to chapter 9 that Peter will have finally gotten it right. I mean, Jesus rebuked him, right? He called him Satan. But no, that's not the case at all. So we're going to see in Mark chapter 9 that Peter doesn't really get it yet. In fact, the other disciples don't really get it yet either. Once again, he's slow to understand. It's as if he's seeing what he wants to see and hearing what he wants to hear. I'm sure you've seen this before, whether something COVID-related or whether about election predictions. Man, people see what they want to see. Oh, yeah, that's for sure going to happen. Or they hear what they want to hear. Well, of course that's the case. And I think we all do that if we're honest with ourselves. We see what we want to see. We hear what we want to hear. Now, as we look at this passage, we're going to see several tricky sections, phrases in here that are legitimately hard to understand. And yet, if we dig through this passage and mine the riches of it like a a gold mine, we'll see how rewarding it really is because we're going to be faced with the truth of who Jesus is. And at the end of it, there is going to be no denying it. Jesus is going to dismantle all of our incorrect assumptions like Peter and the disciples And he's going to show us who he truly is. So first of all, from the first six verses, we're going to see that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. The word radiance doesn't show up, but I think we'll see that concept here very clearly. Look back into chapter 8 and the last verse. Mark 8, 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus here is using that most often used phrase, Son of Man. It's a title that he uses to refer to himself. It's his favorite title to use of himself. He will not only suffer and die, he says, but he will also Come again. And when he comes again, verse 38 teaches us that he will come with his Father's glory with the angels. He is the glory of his Father. This verse sounds very similar to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Verse 38 then moves into verse 1 of the next passage where he says this, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. You might call verse 1 like a hinge verse. It finishes up the last section, but also introduces us to this next section, verses 2 and following. Maybe your translation has in front of you a a paragraph marker starting at verse 2. And that's correct, but it also kind of leads back to verse 1 as well. And this is our first tricky verse for this morning. He says, some who are standing here, well, well, who's the some? And then he says, will not taste death. Well, what does taste death refer to? And then the biggest one is the last phrase, the kingdom of God coming with power. What does that refer to? Well, there have been lots of answers offered over the generations for this particular question about the kingdom of God coming with power. Some people say that it refers to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Others say it refers to the day of Pentecost. But I think the simplest answer is the contextual one. And that's why I had us read verse 38 in addition to verse 1. Is that some of those with him... Meaning, in verse 38, we see that there are are crowds, verse 34, excuse me, there is a crowd with him and along with the disciples. The crowd and the disciples, some of them would personally get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. In other words, the three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, would get get to see a display of God's glory very soon. It's not as if Jesus is saying that everyone else is going to die, meaning taste death, 
but that the rest of the people would have to wait to experience the kingdom of God come in power when Jesus returns. Now, Jesus is possibly referring to more than that, but he at very least has to be referring to at least that, that there are some who are standing right there who would get a glimpse of the kingdom of God come with power. Now, I, the reason I think this is because verse 2 says, after six days, Jesus led them up the mountain, Peter, James, and John, where they were all alone. All three gospel accounts, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all give a time frame here. So I think this is referring to the fact that the sum of those who won't taste death are referring to Peter, James, and John. Now, verse 2, verse two it says that he led them up the high mountain, probably Mount Jebel Jermak or Mount Hermon. And Luke tells us in his account that they went up to pray. And then we see this fancy word here. He was transfigured before him. I don't let the fanciness of that word throw you off. Trans just means over or cross or through. Figure means what he looks like. So he underwent a visual transformation. For those who were present, they could see that something had changed about him. This Greek word is where we get the English word metamorphosis, where something changes. Now, just like is the case in other places in the gospel accounts, the reason that they were up there was to pray. And Jesus was praying, but guess what the disciples were doing? According to Luke, they were sleeping. But then there is a flash of lights, Luke tells us. Verse 3 says, His clothes, Jesus' clothes, became dazzling white, whiter than anyone or any launderer in the world could bleach them. Luke adds in his account that Jesus' face changed appearance too. Luke says that it was as bright as a flash of lightning. No launderer on earth could have bleached Jesus' clothes as white as these disciples were seeing. Matthew adds that his face shone like the sun. Well, that's even brighter than white clothing, isn't it? That's an extremely bright, shining thing. It shines forth. And it's so bright, in fact, that it woke them up. Now, why was Jesus' clothes, not to mention his face, why were they so white? There's a story in the book of Exodus where Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments in his hands, but he was with God. He saw, seen God's backside, and his face was radiant, the text says, because he had spoken with the Lord. Now, is that the case here where Jesus is so bright because he's been talking with the Lord? No. Moses was bright like the moon is bright at night. When you have a full moon at night and you look up in the sky and you're like, wow, that is a bright full moon. Well, the moon isn't shining, is it? It is reflecting, refracting what is given to it, the light that is given to it from the sun. It's a reflection of something brighter. Jesus here is not like the moon. He's like the sun itself. Here's what Psalm 104 says. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment, and he stretches out the heavens like a tent. Or Daniel chapter 7. Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair on his head was white like wool, and his throne was flaming with fire. Now it's a wonder, I think, that the disciples weren't blinded like Paul was on the road to Damascus when he saw a vision of Jesus Christ. Now, to be clear, Jesus wasn't transformed into something that he had not ever been before. It's, it's not as if Jesus had transformed in the sense of changed. No, it's as if his humanity, just for a brief moment, had been peeled back, and the disciples could see Jesus and his divinity, whereas normally they could only see his humanity. The disciples saw the brightness of the glory of God the Son without the hindrance of this human form. That surely is a glimpse of the kingdom of God come with power that we read back in verse 1. They got a glimpse 
with our own two eyes what we, you and I, have to wait to see until Jesus returns in the coming days. John, in his first chapter of his gospel account, says this, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. John says this in chapter 1 as well, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John is not just speaking in a metaphorical way, like he's the light of the world and he, he gives light to people so that they can see what the gospel is all about. That's very true, but he's also light in the literal sense because when this d- humanity got peeled back in the eyes of Peter, James, and John, they got to see a glimpse of the kingdom of God come in power that the rest of us will have to wait to see. And then the text says that Two men, two very unlikely men, show up. Now, it's unlikely because these men have been dead for generations. So look at verse 4. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. What were they talking about? Luke tells us in his account that they spoke about his departure or his exodus which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. His exodus, meaning his exodus from earth, his departure, meaning he would depart from this world, meaning he would die. So they were probably encouraging him to continue on this path. They were comforting him about the horrible suffering that he was about to endure. Now, were they bright like Jesus was bright? Now, Luke says in verse 30 of his account, not chapter 9, verse 30, that they appeared in, quote, glorious splendor. But it doesn't use the same wording that it does of Jesus here. In fact, Mark doesn't even make any mention in his account of Elijah and Moses shining bright. So I think that they had a, a glow about them. They were bright, glorious splendor, but it was nothing compared to Jesus. Jesus outshines anyone. So why them? Why Moses and Elijah? It's commonly thought that Moses is representative of the law and Elijah is representative of the prophets. So Jesus is the fulfillment of both the law and the prophets. So they are there to say, you are the culmination of everything that we had prepared the way for. Now, these might seem a a curious pair since, obviously, the two had never met in person while on earth since they were removed from each other by generations. And yet, there is a passage when both of them are spoken in the same breath. I'm going to read from a few verses from Malachi chapter 4. And I'm going to mention this passage later. So if you want to flip there and then hold your finger there, you can. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and the law I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. And then he says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction." We'll come back to that passage in a moment, but just for now note that the two are mentioned in the same sentence, the same uh, uh, paragraph here. Now, what would you be thinking if you were the disciples? You're, you're, You're blinded by this light. Jesus is suddenly bright as dazzling, with dazzling garments, and his face is as bright as the sun. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. You'd be thinking, what is going on here? Why are Moses and Elijah here? They must have introduced themselves or something. We don't have any record of that. But somehow the disciples knew that Moses and Elijah were Moses and Elijah. So what would you do? Would you just sit there, stand there, and watch? Would you say anything? Well, James and John were smart enough to keep their yap shut. But in typical Peter fashion, he opened his big mouth. Verse 5. 
Mark chapter 9, verse 5. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And as you're reading that, you just think, oh no, Peter, you did not just say that. I mean, he started off so well, right? It's good for us to be here. He should have stopped right there. I mean, yeah, it was good for him to be here. He saw a glimpse of the glory of, of the kingdom, of the power of God, and he should have just said, man, it is good to be here, but he kept going. And he wanted them to stay long term. That's why he says, let us put up three shelters. Peter couldn't grasp, in other words, that Jesus was not their political savior, like the Jews of old thought. He thought, let's just set up camp here. This is the new kingdom of God come in power right here. Let's do it. He thought this was the end, the eschaton, as it were. Let's make up some dwelling places for you and Moses and Elijah to live in. So he was wrong about why they were there. He thought that they were there to set up this political kingdom. And he was also wrong about who they were in relation to Jesus. He saw them as equals. Notice that he says, let's have three shelters, one, two, three, as if they all deserve the same kind of shelter. But they're not. He should have been able to tell that Jesus was the brightest of them all, but he couldn't figure it out. In fact, they apparently all thought this because we see in the next verse this. Verse 6. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. Now, he may have opened his dumb mouth, but they were all frightened to death. So do you see what I mean now when I said earlier that we all see what we want to see? We hear what we want to hear? Peter said out loud what his heart was actually hoping for. He wanted an earthly savior for the earthly people of Israel. He wasn't thinking in terms of his sinfulness. He wasn't thinking in terms of how vast the, the humanity is and how great the need is for salvation. No, he's just thinking of himself and his own people. To use a secular term, it was a Freudian slip. He couldn't help but say what he was actually thinking. And we too often do the same thing when it comes to seeing Jesus. A.W. Tozer has this famous quote where he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What, we th what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing to us. Peter wasn't thinking about his sinfulness. He was thinking about his ethnicity. Now, when you think about God, what are your thoughts like? Jesus is powerful. He's immense. He's great. And these aren't wrong per se, but they're not the full picture, are they? Because Jesus, you basically turn Jesus into a God of my own image if you continue to see him in a one-sided way. Many unsaved people, and I'm sure you've met someone like this, if you ask them who Jesus is, they say, well, he's, he was a good teacher. He was a great man, a very moral man, taught about love, things like that. He's, what they're really saying is this, he's just as good or probably a little bit better of a teacher than I am. If I lived in, in AD 30, I probably would have been a good teacher too. I mean, I'm a pretty good person myself. Or they might think, well, he has some truth, but he's not God. But if Jesus is God, and the scriptures affirm that he actually is God, of course, then that has implications for how I must live how you must live. If Jesus is the dazzling white divine God, which the disciples got to see a glimpse of that we won't get to see for generations perhaps, then this demands something of you. It's hard to blame P Peter for saying what the three of them were thinking since they probably said or thought what we would have said or thought if we were there too. But that doesn't mean it's right. Verse 
God the Father is here confronting us in our attempts to make God in our own image, that mindset that they had and that mindset that we often have. And now he's going to do that in a second way here in a second. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory first, and now second, Jesus is the word of the Father. The word of the Father. Now this is a common concept found throughout the Bible, of course, but I particularly couldn't help but thinking of that great Christmas hymn or Christmas carol, O Come All You Faithful, in which the hymn writer says, Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. And we see it in Hebrews 1 as well. That same verse that I read earlier holds both of these two truths in balance. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. So look at verse 7. Then a cloud, Luke adds, or Matthew adds that it's a bright cloud. A bright cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my Son, whom I love, or my beloved Son. Listen to Him. What did the disciples do when they saw this? When they saw this cloud and heard the voice, well, Matthew and Luke give us the fuller picture once again. It says that they were afraid and they fell down terrified. I think you and I would do the same thing if we were there. In the Old Testament, a cloud indicated the presence of God. You think of that song that we, that we read earlier, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Well, that's, in, I think, probably taken from the Old Testament passages in which we have the pillar of fire and the clouds right there. And the same thing is the case here. God the Father was present, and the cloud indicated that presence. He indicated His presence. And we, of course, know this because He audibly identifies Jesus as his son. This is my son. Well, Jesus is the son of God the Father. Matthew and Luke add that the Father said that Jesus is the one, quote, whom I have chosen and the one in whom I am well pleased. In other words, you can't escape it. Jesus is the well-pleasing, chosen, loved son of God the Father. It might remind you, if you're familiar with the book of Mark, I realize that you haven't been there for the rest of my series in the book of Mark, but just think back through your Bible history. You remember Mark chapter 1 in which Jesus came from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. But back in chapter 1, the disciples had not yet been called, so they weren't there for that. They didn't experience the words of God the Father back in chapter 1, but now they heard it loud and clear. They couldn't escape it. Here is what the Father is saying in essence. He alone is my son. Do you get the implication? Moses and Elijah are not there's a distinction. Jesus is unique. There's also the fact that he is loved. He is my beloved son. He is the one whom I love. The statement in Mark 1, where John the Baptist is there baptizing him and the Father speaks, is given to Jesus. He says, you are my son. But in here in Mark chapter 9, what does he say? This is my son. In other words, it's for the disciples' benefit. Jesus didn't need to hear it. He knew who he was. But the disciples needed to hear it. And what was it that they needed to hear? Not only that this is my son, identifying who he is, but also the command, you must listen to him. Keep on listening to him. Now, if you were there that day on whatever mountain that was, and you had experienced all that the disciples had experienced, what would you remember most? I would venture to say, at least I can only speak for myself, you would remember most what you saw. 
But the father's statement here puts them in order of importance. Not that it doesn't matter that the disciples saw Jesus, but that he's saying, what you heard today is more important than what you saw today. What you saw today needs to come after what you have heard today. That's basically what the father was telling these disciples. So what did they hear? It was an identification of who he was and the command to listen to him. Now, you and I have never experienced something like this. If you think that you have experienced something like this, please talk to your elders and they'll sit down with you. But we've never experienced something like this. And yet we've all experienced God's mighty hand in our lives. For instance, maybe you prayed for something and then God answers your request and you think, wow, isn't God amazing? You saw with your own eyes God do something, you experienced it. Or maybe you've been praying for someone for years or decades to come to salvation in Christ and then while they're on their deathbed, they believe and repent and come to faith in Christ. And you just go, wow, I saw with my own eyes, God saved this person. And those events stick in your minds for years to come, decades to come. But the Father here is warning us against putting experience, what we see, over written revelation. You and I have a divine demand, a command, to listen to God as He speaks. So what has he spoken? Well, that's what we learn in the following verses. So look at verse 8. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Matthew tells us in his account that they were so terrified that they were down on the ground, basically in a, in a ball, and he had to come touch them and tell them, to get up and not be afraid anymore. I think you and I would probably be afraid if we were in that same situation. So Moses and Elijah are gone. In other words, they fulfilled their purpose in talking to him about Jesus' coming death. And then they come down the mountain, verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Now, if you had been following along in my sermon series from Mark, um, uh, like our congregation has, you would have learned that previously the instructions were to not tell anyone, period. Most often the instructions were, don't tell anyone. But now their instructions carried with, with it a caveat. You can tell people, but you have to wait until after I've resurrected from the dead. Now, surely... After all that they have heard and seen, they would get it now, right? They would understand what Jesus means by dying and suffering and then rising again. They, they would have figured out who Jesus really is and why he came. After all, they heard a voice from heaven. They saw this miraculous display on the mountaintop, but nope. Verse 10, they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what, quote, rising from the dead Meant. Now, kudos to them for keeping the matter to themselves, obeying Jesus when he gave them that command. But they were apparently still confused about the resurrection. So what did they think he was talking about? They thought he was talking about the resurrection at the end of all time that all Jews in that, days, in that, that day believed. Now, we know that this is what they were thinking because of the question that they ask in verse 11. They asked him, Why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first. So they're trying to figure this out in their brain. They're like, okay, if a resurrection is coming, and they're thinking end time resurrection, th then why hasn't Elijah come yet? I haven't seen Elijah. Have you seen Elijah? Nope, he hasn't come. After all, the, the prophets of old said this. By the way, when they say the teachers of the law, most often that's ref referring to uh, the, a, a wrong interpretation of the law. But in this case, they actually got it right. They were referring back to that statement in Malachi. So if you still have a finger in Malachi 4, let me read Malachi 4 once again. I will send, verse 4 says, Elijah to you. 
the prophet Elijah to ye before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. The Jews and the scribes apparently all had their theology, their eschatology, the end times theology, correct. They knew their Bible, and yet it wasn't quite right, was it? Their hermeneutics, their interpretation of that passage was wrong. Now, thankfully, Jesus had mercy on them, and he's going to straighten out their minor prophet theology, their eschatology, and he's going to tell them what exactly that passage meant. So Jesus replied, verse 12, to be sure, Elijah does come first. He's saying in the order of events that God has specified, Elijah does come first, and he restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? So Elijah does have to come first. He affirms that their their, uh, understanding, their reading of Malachi 4 is correct. But when it says that Elijah will, quote, restore all things, it doesn't refer to restore in the sense that they thought. They thought it meant that Elijah was going to come and then the kingdom of God will be established in power and Israel will be brought up again to be the greatest nation on earth. But here it actually refers to a reestablishing of something, not of the kingdom of Israel, but of the doctrine of repentance, the reestablishing of the preaching of repentance. So who do we know who preached a gospel of repentance? John the Baptist. Jesus was telling them that John the Baptist is actually the fulfillment of the prophecy about Elijah. And that's one reason we need to listen to him, because I I doubt any of us, if we had lived in that day, would have figured out that Malachi wasn't actually referring to Elijah, Elijah, but he's referring to John the Baptist, Elijah. Now, this isn't a case of, well, it's just probably we think that it was John the Baptist. No, because Matthew, in his account, affirms that it is John the Baptist. Here's what Matthew 17, 13 says. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. He's identifying that their reading was correct, but their interpretation was wrong. So then Jesus asked them a question. Why, then, is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? Well, Jesus isn't asking a question to learn something. It's a rhetorical question. He's making them think about the implications of it all. If John the Baptist suffered contempt and died, then I surely will endure the same. This rejection, this contempt that was shown, was certainly given to John the Baptist, wasn't it? In chapter 6, we read of the end of John the Baptist's life. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And of course, you know the story. Uh, Herodias, Herod's wife, gets Herodias' daughter, her own daughter, to uh, dance for him and to basically give him whatever she wants. And of course, she asks for John the Baptist's head. And John the Baptist's head on a platter, nonetheless. And so, sure enough... It works, the trick works. Herod says in verse 27, immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. So the man went and beheaded John in prison. John the Baptist suffered. He experienced contempt, rejection, just like Jesus would experience it. And that's what he goes on to say in verse 13. But I tell you, Elijah, Elijah, meaning John the Baptist, has come And they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Here's what Jesus is implying. Just as everything prophesied about John the Baptist came true, so everything prophesied about me will come true too. They rejected John the Baptist, my forerunner, Jesus is saying, so they're going to reject me too. Now, on the face of it, this sounds like Jesus is ending on a very gloomy note. He's just kind of, it's not a high note of like you think in a 
uh, a musical piece where da 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 and it ends like that. No, it almost sounds like and just kind of ends right there. And you're like, really? That, that's how you end this section, Jesus? But, but no, this is actually the best news of this whole passage. I promise. Let's look at it. Because think about it. If Jesus was just a dazzling white person to see with our own eyes, we'd be in trouble. After all, which of us have, has seen the dazzling brightness of God the Son? No one. None of us has seen that. But do you know what we all have? We have the written revelation of Jesus Christ for us. The written revelation of Jesus Christ tells us that Jesus died for sinners. And he does so right here in our own passage. The disciples were commanded, you remember, God the Father spoke and he said, listen to him. He did not say, look at him. He said, listen to him. The words that were spoken were to burn in their hearts, not the memory of what they had seen that day. So is that what happened? You think of the three disciples as they go about and, and they go on their, their own way and their ministries and their service to the Lord. What was most impressing about them that day? Well, turn with me now to 2 Peter 1, and we will see the answer to that question. 2 Peter 1, starting in verse, 13, uh, verse 16. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received glory and honor from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, or as the ESV says, something more sure and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter believed what he heard on the mountain was more important than what he saw on the mountain. And if Peter believed that that was more important, shouldn't we too? What he heard on the mountain was a divine call to Jesus. And what Jesus said on that mountain was that his death and life would save humanity. That is the wondrous gospel of Jesus. Do you see how I mean now? It doesn't end on a low note. It ends on a high note. I love seeing magic tricks done. Ever since my grandpa, when I was a kid, would do these little magic tricks, these little toys that he would do and he would show me and I'd just be amazed at these tricks that he would do. I've just always loved the sleight of hand. I got to see a, a magic show in person a couple years ago and I just loved it. Sat there on the edge of my seat. But eyes can be deceived. Hence the whole thing about sleight of hand and magic. Peter wrote to his disciples and told them of something completely reliable. Something, quote, more sure. And that is the written word of God. And it too is bright like Jesus was on the mountain. Peter says in, in his uh, letter there, pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place. In other words, we don't need God to speak to us audibly, orally, like some would claim. Well, you know, the Bible isn't enough. I, need, I want God to speak to me directly. No, we have everything we need to for us is already given in the word of God. So where is your hope found? Where is your faith resting in? It is, is it in the things that you can see with your eyes? Are you like Thomas, who we read at the end of the gospel accounts, wouldn't believe until he put his fingers in the holes of his hands and put his hand in his side? Is that you? Now, this is important because without the intervention of Jesus through his Holy Spirit, we will always see what we want to see and we'll always hear what we want to hear. 
the only way that that pattern can be broken and not seeing what we want to see and not hearing what we want to hear is if we listen to someone outside of ourselves, someone who has given us a divine call. We need to listen to Jesus as he has revealed himself in his word. So this passage is simple. Because of who Jesus is, you must listen to him. He is the radiance of the Father, even if you can't see him right now. You will someday. But most importantly, he is the word of the Father, loved and chosen. He has been communicated to us. The message has been communicated to us through the incarnate God, Jesus Christ. We don't need to see him with our eyes, although we will someday, just like we learned at the end of chapter 8. We don't need a literal epiphany. We don't need for God to reveal himself to us with a bright light or was speaking to us in dreams or something like that. Peter had that. Peter experienced what we will never experience, and yet he focused on something else. He focused on the written word of God. We have all that we need in the written revelation of God. The written word points us to the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. So listen to him. Do you remember that famous verse from Romans 10? How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Well, let me flip that and make it a positive statement. People can call on the one they believe in. We can believe in the one whom we have heard or the one in whom we are listening to. I'd like to close with some practical ways that you can listen to him. First of all, watch out for pretenders of the word. There are lots of examples that I could Discuss, but I want to call your attention to one example that is very common in Christian circles. If you're on ChristianBook.com's uh, mailing list like I am, you get these uh, brochures in the mail every month or two, and it has Christian books that they're selling. And almost invariably, on the front page is a book called Jesus Calling. Some of you have probably seen this book. Maybe some of you own it. Well, here's what the author, Sarah Young, said of her own work. I began to wonder if I could receive messages during my times of communing with God. I had been writing in prayer journals for years, but that was a one-way communication. I did all the talking. I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. In other words, the Bible wasn't enough. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. In other words, it wasn't enough for her to see God's words written right there on the page. She wanted something more. So when you are, if you ever read that book, Jesus Calling, you're actually reading the words of Sarah Young, not God himself. I would encourage you to read something better. It's called the Bible. You read the Bible. Read and study God's word for yourself. Preaching and teaching is an absolute necessity. I'm glad you all are here. I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak, of people who need to listen to preaching by preaching to people who are here right now. And yet, there is a sense in which you have to take responsibility for yourself. Read your Bible every day, like that kid's song says. Read your Bible, pray every day. Remember that song? Don't rely on others to do the work of learning the Bible for you. And if you do want God to, to speak to you in a way that is condensed and, and put in a way that's, toward, that's given to you, utilize a book given back in the 1600s, modernized in today's language, called A Way to Pray by Matthew Henry. And what Matthew Henry does, he takes scriptural <clears throat> verbiage, words, phrases, and he combines them. And he has the references right there in the text. So if you want God to speak to you, open up your Bible. And if you need a little bit of help putting things together in a compact statement, use something like, the, like A Way to Pray by Matthew Henry. It's straight statements taken directly from God's Word. You can also ask pertinent questions about the Word. 
Whether you ask pertinent questions of yourself and you research them yourself or if you can't find the answer and you ask a fellow Christian or a church member or an elder, you can also interpret the word by the word. You let the clearer passages interpret the less clear passages. And then, of course, this is something absolutely essential. We have to ask Jesus for help by his Holy Spirit. We must listen to his word, not rely upon our experiences, not rely upon, I would say, false works like Jesus calling, but look to Jesus in his written word. And it's there that we see the wondrous message of the gospel of Jesus Christ suffering, dying, and rising again for sinners. Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful passage this is of the transfiguration. And what's most important about this passage is not what the disciples saw and what we perhaps wish that we could have seen if we were there that day, but what they heard. And what they heard, we have heard this morning. Give us not only eyes to see, but especially ears to hear what your word says. Help us to be able to grasp the significance, the magnificence of who Jesus Christ is as displayed in his word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.